G'day, welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and today I want to share with you a radio debate that I participated in a few years back uh, on a radio station in England. It was on a program called Unbelievable with Justin Briley. Maybe you're familiar with it. I had just released the book The Porn Myth, which looks like that, <laughs> and um, I got in touch with Justin. I said, I think I'd be willing to do a debate uh, on the topic of pornography. What do you think? Now, you've probably heard me say in the past, I'm not good at debates. I don't really enjoy doing debates. I'm not quick on my feet like some of the awesome and intelligent people I've had on my show. But I thought this would, this would, be, this would be good. I'd like to try, I'd try, my, try my hand at this. So I was in dialogue with two people, Charlotte Rose, who says she is a sexual freedom campaigner, and Adam Scarborough of the Campaign Against Censorship. So it wasn't a formalized debate where I got a bit of time and then they got a bit of time. It was just more of a conversation. And um, it was kind of interesting to have to go up against two different people. Um, I don't know how well I did. I mean, I think I did okay. You can tell me below what you thought. You know, I knew that this bloke against censorship was going to be kind of a libertarian and was going to try to say, that's fine if you have this particular opinion about pornography, but you shouldn't impose that upon the world. You shouldn't try and censor things. Cens censoring things are wrong. And I, I really didn't want to have to get into the discussion about what should be censored and what shouldn't be. So this is, this is the approach I took. We can have a discussion about what involvement the government should have when it comes to regulating a certain thing like pornography. But in order to even have that discussion, we, we first need to decide whether or not pornography is harmful to individuals, relationships, and society. Because if it isn't, then yeah, I would agree. Then any conversation about censoring it would, would kind of be ridiculous. But if we can establish that it is harmful, then we can move on to what role should the government play. Um, Anyway, let me know. <laughs> let me know what you thought. Um, the book's really great. If you haven't seen the book, it is a non-religious response to pro-porn arguments. It's on Audible. It's on Amazon. And no matter where you buy it, a hundred percent of my royalties go to help sexually traffic victims in San Diego. So I don't make a cent from the purchase of, of this book, um, but I think it's a good book, and I put a lot of research into it. Uh, the group in San Diego, by the way. They're doing an amazing job. They're called Children of the Immaculate Heart. Um, check them out. Uh, okay. Also, since we're talking about pornography, do you know that I've created a, uh, a course? It's called strive21.com. This is a 21-day detox from porn course. So if you struggle with porn or lust in any way and you're tired of it, go check this out. It is incredibly well produced. We've put a lot of money behind it. Uh, the app should be rolling out shortly. We have over, yeah, look at that, over 24,000 men going through it right now. Uh, every day, you get a five-minute video or thereabouts from me sent to your email. And so it's basic idea is that whenever I talk about pornography, I always think to myself, gosh, there's so much to say. What if I could journey with somebody for, say, 21 days? What would I, what would I say to them and what would I have them do? And so in for every day, there's a there's a small challenge that has to be completed. And, you know, like things like coming up with a sobriety plan or finding an accountability partner, things like that. And we've got great reviews. If you go up here, click reviews, check it out, see what the men are saying. We hope to be developing one for women shortly, but right now it's just for men. So two cool things about this is that it's 100% free and you can be as anonymous as you want. So you know, what are you waiting for? Go check out strive21.com, strive21.com. All right, here is my debate with Adam Scarborough and Charlotte Rose. Let me know what you think below. Thanks. Great to have you on, Matt. Um, many people may know you for the, your role in uh, apologetics from a Catholic perspective, but um, this book that you've written, it's not really coming, as far as you're concerned, from a religious perspective, is it? <clears throat> That's right. It's a non-religious response to pro-pornography arguments. 
I think that over the last, I'd say, 20 or 30 years, there's been a lot of research coming out of academia that gives us good reason to think that pornography consumption is detrimental to the consumer, to our relationships, and to society, and that there actually isn't really good reason to think that it's healthy for society. And so I travel and speak to about 50 to 70,000 people every year on this topic. I never imagined that I'd be do <laughs> doing this. My I always joke my mum's really proud of me, um, but it's a real <laughs> delight. It's been wonderful to be able to journey alongside men and women who might say they're addicted to this stuff and, and want to stop. So my approach is, is definitely not a shame-based one. It's basically trying to invite people to live the sort of life that they want to and not to let pornography stand in the way. Well, it's, it's great to have you on the program today, Matt. Where did this particular interest in writing on this particular subject come from for you? Yeah, so porn is something I dealt with as a kid, like many kids. I remember, you know, as an eight-year-old kid, this was before the time of the internet, if you wanted porn, you had to find a friend's dad, you know, who hid, who hid it in his closet. And I remember, you know, at the time... You'd say to your friend, you know, your dad's so cool. But as we got older, you know, looking back, I don't know if it really was that cool to sort of uh, masturbate to women pretending to like you, that sort of thing. And so I, even though I looked at pornography a lot, I never felt terrifically, you know, proud of having done it. Uh, and it wasn't until about the age of 17 that I put in a good effort to try and stop it. I didn't like the negative effects I was seeing that it was having uh, in my own life, in my ability to create in my most cherished relationships. And so just started speaking out about it because I found a significant degree of freedom from it. And, uh, and yeah, just, just started talking about it to other people. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in it. So I've been doing that ever since. It's a less taboo subject than it once was, partially because it is so widespread now, the use of pornography, its availability online and so on. Um, I mean, do you have any information on, on how the statistics are in terms of usage among Christians as well? Because you might say, oh, Christians, you'd expect not to be using pornography. But, but I guess a lot of Christians, <laughs> right. just as you did, struggle with, with, with using it. Yeah, well, certainly, you know, studies show that religious people use pornography, or at least say they use pornography, far less than those who aren't religious. But certainly, you know, Christian men and women look at pornography. And so when people ask me if I speak at a, uh, you know, Catholic university or something, why are you preaching to the choir? I like to tell them, well, the choir is looking at porn. Uh, so, yes, this certainly is yeah. a problem among people of every different religion and none. And I want to make that clear because there's a lot of non-religious people who are speaking out against pornography as well. This isn't a religious issue. This is a, I just want a more beautiful life. I want a more fulfilling sex life or something issue. And so I know plenty of atheists and, and others who would who run significant websites and it's been uh, interesting talking out about it it's been interesting to see that some you know unlikely voices have come up recently on this front um, people like <laughs> russell brand and pamela anderson you know former obviously of baywatch and playboy pinup and so on um not the most obvious voices but people who've actually spoken out against the the, the tide i think um russell brand compared it to a, a filthy icebergs floating through your house sort of thing um what, what why do you think that's happening in that regard Right, yeah. James Hetfield, actually, lead singer of Metallica, is also narrating an anti-porn documentary. Uh, I think it's because of the explosion of internet porn. I mean, since the advent of tube sites around 2006, a lot of people are beginning to speak out about the detrimental effects that it's having in their life. And I think perhaps the reluctance to speak out about it up until now has been just the fact that like, no one is saying we want to go back to a, purita a puritarian, uh, puritarian era uh, where the, the sight of an, a woman's ankle could cause scandal. That's ridiculous, right? The, the problem with porn isn't that it shows too much. The problem with porn, I would say, is that it shows far too little of the human person, right? That it reduces a person to a sort of two-dimensional thing to be consumed. So the problem isn't sex. Sex is good. Sexual desire is good. If it, if it wasn't, you couldn't make it ugly. That's an interesting perspective. Okay, I just want to take a pause for a quick moment to say thank you to Hello. Now, if you are not familiar with Hello, you need to be. It is an excellent app that will help you pray and meditate. It is very, 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 very well produced. It is 100% Catholic. It has all sorts of amazing things on it. It is the number one downloaded Catholic app uh, in the United States. 
tons of five-star reviews. It's really great. I would highly recommend you downloading it right away. They have a free version of their app that has a ton of content that's updated regularly. But if you want to get access to the entire app, they've got a lot of great stuff on it. Go to hallow.com slash mattfrad, and uh, I'll put a link below. Use the promo code mattfrad when you sign up, and you'll get three months for free to try the entire app out. My wife and I have used it. We like legitimately think it's excellent. You can listen to meditations with Gregorian chant in the background. You can listen to you know someone lead you through a Lexio Divina experience or a sort of examination of conscience at the end of the day. You can have it help you pray the rosary. So, yeah, if you if you want to get better at praying, if you want to be more consistent at it, go check out my friends at Hallow. They're they're doing really good work. Hallow.com slash Matt Frad. Uh, again, the link is below. Download it today. That's an interesting perspective. Thank you for joining us today, Matt. And um, somewhat unusually for the program, we've actually got two voices who are going to be uh, debating this with you today on the program. Let me introduce the first of them, Adam Scarborough from the Campaign Against Censorship. Um, Adam, thank you for joining me. Yeah, in you're studio more than welcome. Today. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here today. Could you briefly yeah. explain what the Campaign Against Censorship is? Yeah, first of all, I'll just say you know, to Matt, uh, congratulations on his book. I did have a brief look at it. It's a very well, well researched book, and it doesn't come across as ostensibly a religious publication. I was looking for little god quotes now and again but i didn't actually see it so um you have stayed away from religion to be fair to you and there's a number of case studies and i've had a little look at it but not too much but yeah what are we what's our case the cac the, the campaign against censorship basically stands for the right for consenting adults to see and view what they want to see as opposed to what the state want us to see um we never wanted you know a, a wonderful british um, writer joel joel well we never wanted to see 1984 arrive unfortunately now with the uh, advent of the Investigatory Powers Act and the Digital Economies Bill it has and uh, and what we're worried about is this creeping repression towards a totalitarian state we believe individuals should be the right not to see something is just as important as the right to see something um, and what's your view of the rise of pornography as, on the internet? I mean, yeah. do, you, do you kind of welcome that in terms of you know as in a neutral sense you know it's up to people whether they access it or not? Yeah I mean, uh, uh, what do you think? I mean, I know the, the internet has been a massive uh, game changer in people's attitudes towards censorship. And, and with the, I think, I understand 90% of the internet is, is pornography, I believe. Matt may know more about that than me. But um, I think um, sex is a very, very powerful drive. And, and um, it's, it's, I think there has to be provision made from, for sexuality. I mean, being a former soldier myself, I was stationed in various locations. The guys found ways of, of, of enjoying themselves and finding a means for their reproductive urges shall we say um so but i think to suppress sexuality is very wrong but as far as children are concerned on the internet i think you know there is a thing called parental control and it should be down to parents again as opposed to the state to decide what their parent what their children can and cannot see mm. um let me come yeah. to our, our guest on the phone now uh, charlotte um charlotte thank you for joining me um you've uh, you're, Yay, thank you. you're you're a colorful person um and <laughs> um, I, I, I will just remind all of our contributors on the programme today, we are broadcasting at a, a daytime hour. We're not post-watershed. So uh, we'll just bear that in mind in terms of the how graphic we are when it comes to discussing the, the subject matter today. But Charlotte, um, you've, you've been involved alongside people like Adam um, in campaigning against censorship. And indeed, uh, you welcome um, adults expressing their sexuality through pornography or, or other means. You, you don't want to see anyone clamping down uh, in this particular area? You know, I've also been in a documentary with Russell Brand, and, um, which was Love for Sale, which was with Rupert Everett in 2014. And I think the unfortunate thing is, is like Russell Brand, when, when you become an addict, as it were, as what he quoted himself as, they become the worst when it comes to uh, reformed smokers or reformed addicts in that sense. He doesn't give you that opportunity to be able to see it in both sides. Um, I think that what Matt is saying and what Adam is saying has got absolute massive relevance. But the understanding of what we've gone through in history is all about education. When we as a society have been taught to look at sex as a procreative um, attitude and nothing more, people will want to be able to explore sexual desire and, 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 and exploration within their own bodies. And if there is no other material or educational a point of view out there other than pornography, where, where do people, where can people go to to find that education? This is the unfortunate thing is if we don't, if we're not looking as, as 
sex as a desire, as a natural, normal form of sexual expression, then that education that we can relate to is not out there. The only thing that's being created is pornography, and that's the only choice that people have to go to to be able to watch it. So, so in that sense, are you saying, Charlotte, that you, it, it's not a good thing that there is so much porn, that that is the thing that many young people, for instance, are likely to encounter more than, if you like, more rounded views of sexuality? No, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing either. I think that if you're addicted to cakes and there's a hundred different cakes out there for you to choose from, which one do you go for? I think it doesn't matter on which one's more dangerous or which one's more harmful or which one's got better ingredients for you. It's about the education that comes behind it. This is the thing that there is a lack of, of education of looking at sex as a sexual expression rather than just teaching people as a, about sex as procreation and that's it. I think the sex is a wonderful thing, and I think people should be enjoying it more. But, um, but this is the thing. It all comes down to choice. Providing it's consensual, it doesn't harm a third party. Nobody has the right to choose what people are doing behind closed doors. But we do have a right to supply education to be able to allow people to make those choices for themselves. And if they're dictated to by a Victorian state that's, that's what's allowed to be shown online and what's not, and that choice has been taken sure. away from them. So how on earth can they learn yeah. what's right and wrong in their own opinion? Well, I don't want our conversation necessarily to focus too much around the censorship issue per se, because in a sense, I think Matt sees that as yeah an issue that does need to be addressed. But for, for you, Matt, I, I believe it's more about the the ultimate sort of question of whether the porn is harmful to society. Is it um, ultimately something that we need to be wary of and, and so on? I mean, what do you say to that, that particular argument? It's just about people's free choice in terms of what they want to consume as consenting adults. I sympathise with a lot of what Charlotte and Adam had to say there. Um, we live in a global economy, right? Porn is consumed in every nation on the planet. The fact is that national laws, judicial systems, regulatory agencies uh, move a lot slower than, than technology. I have no brilliant ideas about how to change that, nor am I that interested in doing it. I think a conversation can be had about whether or not governments choose to regulate pornography use. I think an argument can be made. Uh, but, you know, in my opinion, I, as I say, I can sympathize with Adam in saying that some versions of these of censoring pornography that I've heard of sound like prohibition laws in America back in the 1920s, which would unnecessarily turn, you know, relatively normal citizens into you know, criminals. Okay, so I get that. But that said, before we even decide whether or not we should speak out against pornography, you know, maybe it's not a matter of censorship. Maybe it's about educating people that it leads to negative effects. Well, before we can have that conversation, we have to ask, well, is it harmful at all? And it turns out that it is. There are currently 33 neuroscience-based studies on porn users. Every one of them supports the addiction model. huh? And this has led to an increase in porn-induced erectile dysfunction. And again, I want to make it clear, this isn't something that Christians are talking about. This, uh, this is, these are people like Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, who's the clinical urologist at Harvard Medical School, Norman Doidge, who wrote The Brain That Changes Itself. There are literally tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of stories of men online who say, I cannot get an erection when I'm with my girlfriend, when I'm with my wife, but when I'm with porn, I can. We should take that seriously. The other way it affects us is that it warps our sexual taste. Uh, there was a study done in 2012 of NoFap users, which is a non-religious online forum, has about 200,000 members, and many of them said, it was over around 60%, said that their sexual tastes became increasingly extreme or deviant. And now you might be thinking, well, maybe they're just discovering who they really are and what their sexuality really is. Well, that's not true because when they took time away from pornography, they found that their sexual tastes kind of went back to the way they were before uh so that's that's how it's affecting us individually just, just, i wanted to kind of come back on this this issue of the science because i think this is a fascinating area do, do you want to give us a very brief summary of what's going on neurologically when people view pornography and why that inhibits ultimately or, or, or kind of gives this i think it's almost like a law of diminishing returns in terms of what they then find arousing just in in terms of normal um sexual interactions right so you know, doctors and scientists used to think that in order for something to be addictive, it had to be a substance that you put into your body, like nicotine, alcohol, and whatever. 
But since neuroscientists started looking into the brain, it's changed how we understand addiction, right? What we now know is that it's not necessarily just about what we put into our bodies or how it got there, but what reactions it triggers in the brain. And so the fact is, behaviors that are addictive or drugs that are addictive, in order for them to be addictive, what they must do is boost a neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine uh, in the reward center of the brain. And what we're discovering is when people consume pornography compulsively, that this leads to a downgrading, huh? Dopamine begins to shrink, and then the uh, the nucleus accumbens, that's the name of the reward center, is now in a state of dopamine craving. Because of this, people find they need to use more pornography and often more deviant or what they would consider harder forms of pornography just to boost the dopamine levels up enough just to feel even. One more thing I want to say. In 2014, a study came out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany. That's sort of the Harvard of Germany in Berlin. Uh, Simo Simone Kuhn, the lead neuroscientist researcher, and her team were able to show that there was a correlation between the amount of porn people used and shrinkage in the brain, right? Uh, so <laughs> these people that they studied on weren't self-declared addicts. They said they used pornography moderately, and yet it was having this negative effect on the brain. So it leads to desensitization and this feeling within the person, okay, I need to be viewing much more just to feel even. It's as if we've reset the pleasure thermostat in our brain. So, yeah, it's an interesting analogy. Um, okay, let, let me bring in my other guests. Um, Adam, what, what do you want to say? I mean, the, mm. the science appears to speak for itself that uh, viewing pornography has this addictive effect um, and that ultimately mm. it means that people find it actually harder to have, if you like, normal sexual relations outside of a pornographic yeah, well, I, kind I of I did try images. and have a look at some of Matt's um, case studies in his book very briefly uh, and um, I, I appreciate there will always be people that where, where that find something ob- addictive or obsessional in all in all ways. Um, but I be- I do I'm a great believer that people can be self regulatory. And um, you know, in philosophy, they say the wise man is the one who knows his own limitations. And I think we should all know our own limitations. And if what you were, if what you're saying is true, Matt, then surely 90 percent of the population <laughs> would have shrinking brains. Um, I mean, dopamine. Yes, dopamine does exist. Um, um, I think some of the antipsychotic medication that, that um, psychiatry that suppresses the dopamine levels. Um, cannabis is known to be a dopamine antagonist. I won't get off the subject here. Um, but um, to, to say that you've got to have a blanket ban on, on pornography because of a few individuals that have problems yet, and I don't want to deny those people their, their, the help that they deserve, they rightfully deserve, um, this is, I think, too much time in front of a computer looking at anything can be detrimental to one's health, um, for your eyesight, etc. Um, but there, there will always be an exception to the norm, if you know what I mean. And, and you, you don't see this as the norm then, um, as far as you're concerned? Not at all. I mean, I know only a friend of mine, she knows that her children has, um, you know, unobtrusively looked at the pornography. But she said to me recently that I, at least I know what sexuality, how my children are sexually inclined. Uh, as a, uh, you know, as a, I mean, what, how far would Matt take it? I mean, children are given sexual education lessons at school, um, um, which involve sexual imagery and, and pictures of male and, and female um, genitalia. Um, uh, are you saying that all children that are subject to sex education are also deranged in some way or have shrinking brains? Matt, do you want to come back on that? Oh, yeah. No, not at all. I actually think that you and I, Adam, are probably in more agreement than you think. I- I'm not talking about censorship. I'm not denying that people can do whatever they want. Of course, people can do whatever they want. What I'm saying is that it's prudent before engaging in a behavior that might have detrimental effects uh, that one have the most information at your at their disposal. I know you would agree with that. I know Charlotte would as well. Uh, but certainly one can educate children about sex, the goodness of their bodies, right? And these sorts of things. Uh, I don't consider that pornographic. All I'm saying is if there's good reason to think that pornography is detrimental to us and to our relationships, right? Studies have shown that even moderate use of vanilla porn leads people to think less of their partner's affection, physical appearance, sexual performance. All I'm saying is that people have a right to know that. Um, so yeah, that's it. Let me let me come to Charlotte before, before we have to go to a break. Um, Charlotte, what's your take on all this? Um, 
Um, you, you, I mean, you obviously think, have seen a lot of men yourself. And do you find that they um, are having difficulty being aroused outside of pornography if they're, they're, they're using it a lot? Do you know, I have a, I have a complete mixture. I mean, what we've got to look at is a sense of, is society not understanding the differences between the reality side of sex and the fantasy side of sex? The fantasy side of sex has been, been drummed onto the internet that's easily accessible, whereas the reality side of sex is not something that is so accessible because it doesn't get the numbers of viewers when it comes to pornography online. I think we've all got uh, some valuable points to this, uh, to this conversation overall. But the biggest picture is whether anything is bad for you or detrimental to your health. The, uh, life is detrimental to your health. Everything causes different issues within our bodies, cancer, uh, uh, different ailments and such. It's about understanding that, what, um, that level of, of what is deemed as normal and what can be deemed as harmful. Again, going back to the point of, you know, it's, it's actually it's, it's cheaper for you to eat unhealthy than it is for you to maintain a healthy lifestyle because it's what, the, it's what, the, it's what advertisers or creators uh, are able to, uh, to get monies from. What's that bigger, bigger value? And, and pornography is. There aren't many people out there that offer an understanding of uh, reality, fantasy, then there is just fantasy that could be deemed as hardcore. The, this is a problem. When you look at what everybody's been saying about education, it's not education that we're understanding about the human bodies for identities, diversities, and fantasies. We're learning about how to procreate, and that's it. There is no such thing as what goes into a, um, a sex education class of, of different tools, of, of tools, of, of toys that can be used within the bedroom. It's not. It's a um, boy has penis, girl has vagina, and this is how you procreate. There is nothing on the lines of, of understanding the different elements of sexual fantasy, sexual arousal that needs to be able to be given for these people to be able to make a choice. And if the only element for them to be able to see something that's different outside of school is pornography, that's where they'll go. So your, your view is not that we should um, in any way censor pornography. We should simply give pe the young people more information about what the reality more is. More information of, of and give there. them a choice to be able to make that decision for themselves. Because if, those, if that education is not out there, how, how do people learn whether what's good, what's not I mean, not good, should, should we, what, I think... How, how much should they view? I, do you think then those who are producing pornography should, as it were, put health warnings on their material to say this may detrimentally impact your, you know, sexual, your, your sexual ability? Over, you know. It's not their responsibility to do that as a provider. It, it, it wouldn't. But you have to look at in what, what does pornography actually do? And they do do this. They do, do, they do put uh, information onto their films. Good ethical pornographers will put information on there to say, number one, that everything that is within this content of this video has been consensually approved. No harm was caused to any, any of the producers or, or any of the performers. And I think that's ethical. And I, I, I like that. I like the fact that if I am watching pornography, online that is of hardcore nature that I know that everything was consensual and nothing is deemed deemed unnatural and I, I'm happy with that it's not about that it's not about the pornographers because at the end of the day the por pornographers are the people are out there are the only ones that are fighting to ensure age verification processes are on those websites the government's not doing that the pornographers are doing that which shows that they do they are caring uh, towards, the, to, towards okay. the youth of the community let's, but let's... we're not on about that what we're on about is giving people an opportunity to be able to have that education and knowledge out there to make up their own mind. Um, I mean, Charlotte saying there, as far as she's concerned, um, as long as it's done ethically, the, the you know that the, the, you know and she approves of the use of um, you know she prefers um, if if people are going to use it to have these ones that are in some way ethically sourced. Uh, there, are, it says that there was no harm done in the making of this and so on. And um, what what's your view on that? Because presumably, from your point point of view, it's it's not just about consenting adults. You, presumably, right. you believe the problem goes a bit deeper than that. 
I do. I do think that uh, one can make a non-religious argument against pornography. I clearly think that pornography is in and of itself immoral. I'd be happy to talk about that if you want. The reason I'm speaking about the effects of pornography is I think that people have a right to know about them, and it usually moves people uh, a great deal. Uh, this idea of ethical pornography, to me, it's somewhat of an oxymoron. You know, in 2007, there was a study done in which uh, 304 sex scenes of the most popular pornographic DVDs DVDs were reviewed, okay? And what they found in this study was an incredible amount of physical aggression and verbal aggression. There was actually an act of physical aggression, such as slapping, choking, hair pulling, verbal aggression, every minute and a half. Now, Charlotte wants to say, well, it's okay because they both consent to it. And I certainly agree that that's part of it. We don't want people uh, being forced to do things they don't want to do, obviously. But the idea that someone can consent to being degraded like that and that that somehow makes it okay. I, I disagree. Uh, I, I think that being cool with being degraded doesn't make being degraded any more cool. I mean, suppose you met somebody uh, who was was okay being part of different, say, little racist videos where they were the butt of the joke. And they say, well, they found this liberating. People should be able to do what they want, you know, and don't take yourself so seriously. Uh, we might say to them, I get that you're saying you find this liberating, but I think that you're wrong to. I don't think you ought to be treated like that. Uh, secondly, I want to respond to Charlotte's point. She seems to think that our only options are we look at hardcore porn or people just aren't getting getting taught about sex. And I think that's nonsense. I think parents have a duty to teach their children about the beauty of sex. Now, when my, my wife and I got married, we saved sex until our wedding night. And what a beautiful thing now that we have the rest of our lives to learn how to please each other and to enjoy this sexual embrace, which is such a good thing. We don't have to turn our eyes away from each other Okay, onto a screen to watch actors pretending to enjoy sex. Many of these actors, I think it would be fair to say, have suffered a degree of trauma in their childhood. Uh, might be uh, might be having different diseases. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to look at my wife. I think she's enough for me. I think this is the sort of relationship people have a right to that they want to have. And very often we become jaded and think, well, that's that kind of love isn't possible. So I'm just going to settle for for pornography let's uh, bring charlotte in because obviously you were addressing yes, please. yeah yes, go, please. go ahead i mean a few a few different I things think, to pick up there charlotte go ahead i think that was actually awful what matt just said and uh for, for a start um porn stars are not diseased uh secondly we're not all into a point of view about sex that we wait till our, um, our wedding night to have sex uh, the majority of children of today have already lost their virginity before they're in long-term relationships. So that's quite, that's quite Arcadian. That's very, very ancient times. But I do appreciate other people's traditions. But to say that porn, uh, porn produce, well, porn performers are, have all been abused. This is the actual, this is the, this is the unfortunate thing about the way that society sees sex workers as performers. They always see us very 2D, which is either very tragic or very glamorous. Very tragic in the sense that we've been abused. We've been abused, and that's, that's the only reason why we can do this job. And I find that anybody that says that is absolutely degrading to any sex worker or performer out there. I know many performers out there who absolutely love uh, being in, being in films because that's their choice to do so. When it comes to being choking or being spanked or being slapped, there are many thousands of people out there that enjoy different kinks within their, within their, uh, their bedrooms of sex does not mean that, that somebody else may agree to it, but who are you to decide what is norm and what is not norm? There's no such thing. This is a great thing about being, about being individual for people's personal preference when it comes to the bedroom. The normative element to it is very, very sad. And to think that everybody has been abused that ends up in porn is, is awful. And I don't know, I don't know how, far, how much more I can do with this conversation um, because my throat is absolutely killing me. I so I'm just going to stay on the back burn on this for a little bit, and I'm going to let Adam yeah. carry okay. on. Yeah, we'll, okay. We'll, right, we'll, let, we'll let Adam take over a bit. I know you're joining us with uh, uh, some tonsillitis at the moment, but, but let, let's let... take much yeah. time. Go, go ahead, Matt. Charlotte, I appreciate what you're saying, and I actually agree with what you're saying. I didn't say that all sex workers have been sexually abused or molested or abandoned as children. I, I, and so I, I agree with you. To make a blanket statement like that would be irresponsible at best, okay? So I, I don't want to take up too much time. I know Adam wants to respond, but I'd like to 
to pick up on that thread afterwards, if that's okay. Well, do, I mean, do you want to just respond before Adam comes back to, to sure. the fact that obviously Charlotte's saying there as well, right. that, that right. as far as well, she's concerned, I, 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 you, you're entitled to your view that sex is best saved till marriage, Matt, but everyone else, you know, oh, she, she described it as archaic, actually, because kids are having you know sexual encounters well before now, no, they're notice into that it. i didn't say notice that i didn't say my wife and i hadn't had sex until marriage i mean it's not like you know we were virgins like i i had slept around i did stuff uh but when i met her i thought she was worth the wait and that was my personal preference i accept that that's not charlotte's and and that's fine uh and she also said that she respects others traditions and so i appreciate that i don't feel attacked in at all in that uh, i did mention about many performers suffer you know suffering from some kind of disease. And and that's actually a quote from Dr. Sharon Mitchell, who's the founder of the Adult Industry Medical Healthcare Foundation, right? She says that 66% of porn stars have herpes. And I'm not sure we need a lot of stats to convince us of that. If we're having sex with multiple people for our job, what are the chances we aren't going to be struggling with different sorts of diseases? And it didn't say all women. Now, what about women who might have be, suffered some serious form of abuse or neglect when they were younger? Certainly not all women, not making that argument argument, but many women do. Pamela Anderson just came out, spoke about being sexually abused. Jenna Jameson talks about being gang raped in high school. Bella Knox, the Duke University porn performer, speaks about being a rape victim, an ex-cutter. We can go on and on. All I'm saying is when I speak with women who've been in the sex industry or when I listen to them after they get out, that very often they do talk about this 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 sort of uh, story. It's drearily predictable. Is it all women? No, but I think it is a lot. And I think we should recognize that that might be one of the factors that led them into porn. But I do think that even if somebody wasn't abused, they've had a lovely childhood and they just choose this, this is my opinion. And I grant that Charlotte's going to disagree, maybe Adam as well. That's fine. Uh, but I think it's actually a manful thing to treat a woman who has forgotten her dignity with dignity nonetheless. Let's come back to to Adam, and then I'm sure Charlotte will want to weigh in again um, in the course of the yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I can say. I mean, my mum being a former bunny girl, my mum was one of the original bunny girls in the '60s, and she looks back on her modelling days and and the Playboy Mansion, you know, with um, a great degree of pride. Uh, still got some of the photographs. Um, but I'm glad Matt does admit that sex does exist, you know, because it, it's a say it's a very very powerful urge. I mean, but, but having the, said that, Adam, I mean, the, yeah. bu- the bunny girl thing, it yeah. it was a kind of a different age, and if if you don't, I'm in a sense somewhat mm. more innocent if you can grade these things um, well from the, some the type of, of yeah maybe the, innocent yeah um um you know she did other things as well but but um it was how can i start the first start of, a, of the porn genre if you like i mean mm. and pornography let, let, let me make it clear porn like the term prostitute are two very very emotive words i prefer the term i think erotography and for a porn prostitute i think it was the term sex worker and to concur with charlotte i do have a great de- degree of sympathy uh, for women particularly street walkers i think 140 40 have been killed over the last uh, 10 years and I find this very very sad they, sh- they should be given respect they shouldn't be treated in any pre- punitive fashion but to get back to what Matt was saying and Charlotte um, the Mas- Maslow the psychologist um, has admitted in his triangle of needs that sex is at the top it's it's there with food and water and shelter it is a need um, and, and as I say most people are self-regulatory you know if they look at um, uh, pornography two times a day they'll probably put it down and pick up Shakespeare they know when enough is enough um, and getting back to the psychological effects of pornography as Matt you know went overboard on this um especially in some of his case studies in his book um i've i've looked at some of the kinsey studies um sexual studies and, and it said that actually masturbation when it comes to i know this is a family show so i apologize for using that word it's all right um you know when it comes to intensity of orgasm mas- masturbation cannot be excelled um whether it leads to an exacerbation of dopamine levels or not i've never heard that one before but i think we should also look at some of the case studies that matt has provided for us and to find out what sort of background those people came from whether it's a guilt uh, I mean, background what, one of the things you're, you're saying or i'm picking up from you there adam is is the idea that um it you know everyone has sex drives and this is just one way in which it can be released for for certain people you talked about your comrades in the army and obviously they were using pornography as part of that you know in an environment where they didn't have their partners around yeah. or whatever i think to say they, used, you, they, they would probably say they studied it they, right. they just studied okay. it i've only studied it the, myself the, the, i haven't actually used it but regardless i mean the, the point being that for you that's a that's a legitimate thing that's just a way of dealing with with the natural urges that, yeah. that you yeah. have and and from well, like, i'd compare it to what desmond 
Morris said in his book, The Naked Ape, I think he, he referred to these things like smoking as a, a, as a displacement activity. He went on to say something about anti-explorational behaviour as, 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 as animals we really like. And I know Christians don't necessarily see us as animals, but we like to be on the savannas. But all this is really a form of anti-explorational behaviour. And yes, masturbation and pornography does enhance the experience. Um, okay, Matt. What about the argument that it's it's just an outlet? It's just a way, you know, um, that that people are naturally going to be looking for this stuff anyway. So, so just yeah, you know, go go ahead. Well, I mean, Adam said that sex is a need. He said like shelter, food, and water, but that's clearly not true. If you don't have sex, you're not going to die. But if you don't have food, water, or shelter, you very well may. So I grant sexual desire is a beautiful thing, right? It should propel us to make a gift of ourselves. But what pornography does is it actually, we don't end up making a gift of ourselves. We end up kind of reverting back into ourselves. I think one of the most sex positive things a person can do is quit pornography because there's nothing sex positive about about masturbating to images of women pretending to, to like you. There's nothing about retreating into the bathroom or to the bedroom uh, to, to, to masturbate to porn. And a lot of people are beginning to recognize this. It, they're quitting porn not because they hate sex or because they think it's bad or dirty, but they, they're quitting porn precisely because they want to have a meaningful sex life, which pornography is robbing from them. We should point out, too, that when I talk about sexual dysfunction, and by the way, this study was a study that came out of Cambridge, right? So again, these are legitimate uh, studies that are, that are coming out of legitimate universities that showed around 60% of those s- said they could get an erection with porn, not without it. But also women who aren't able to have the same kind of climax because of the pornography they've been consuming. So again, I think if you want if you want to be sex positive, quit porn. If you want to be sexually dissatisfied, then continue looking at porn because apparently that's the way to do it. Okay, um, I'll, I'll bring you in if if your voice allows now, Charlotte, to to, to respond to this. Uh, um, what what do you I want just, to say? I think that I think with with Matt's studies that he's that he's been getting the information from, I think it's fantastic that there is information out there. But it would be very interesting to find out how many participants were into those studies and um, and also the ratio between men and women because one of the things that we keep forgetting about is it's not just men that watch porn but females too. And I think that considering if Cambridge has done a study on 200 people yet there's over a million people in the world watching pornography, I think there's plenty of room for, for more studies to come for in, in the future. I think this just comes back straight back down to the simple element right at the beginning is if people have only got one way to be able to view something that's in the privacy of their own home, which is pornography, which may be deemed as hardcore, that's the genre, that's the genre that we're talking about, obviously, um, then people then people are going to do whatever whatever is, is uh, seen in front of them. I think that if we're offering more education to children and there's more education available online to give those people that choices, that, like what Matt said, this is what's been happening with this percentage of people, then, then we should be made aware of it. I think that um, if you are feeling... I, I'm a sexual trainer. I do lots of work with, with men with erectile dysfunction and also premature ejaculation. And, and a lot of it is not deemed to pornography. It's, it's actually done to psych, a psychology of where something has happened in their past that was detrimental to them growing up with their own self-confidence. So, um, you know, my studies have actually been with hands-on people. Over 1,200 people I've dealt with in the past seven years for erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. And out of that, I think I've only ever come across nine people that have had any difference that's been caused from porn addiction, what? as it were, if it was that. What about, but we're not talking about that. Well, well I, I did want to bring up something else that Matt raised earlier and we didn't really get to, which is his contention that um, there's a sense in which exposure to pornography and the fact that, if you like, to recreate the kind of dopamine levels means that people t- end up searching more and more kind of gratuitous hardcore stuff and i'm guessing even uh, more taboo stuff matt i don't know if you want to talk to this and then i'll bring charlotte back on but are you saying that there's a link actually between consensual adult pornography and child pornography uh well i appreciate what charlotte just brought up having to say about how many people are being interviewed and these sorts of things one study that happened in i, I mentioned to it I mentioned it earlier, from NoFap, there were 1,500 people in the survey, right? Almost 60% said or agreed with the statement that their sexual desires had become increasingly deviant and that when they stopped looking at porn, they were able to 
you know, they, they, they didn't know, they no longer desired that sort of thing. Charlotte also used the analogy of junk food a while back. I think that's, I think that's a good analogy. I think if people become accustomed to junk food, they can't imagine how you could possibly eat healthy and be happy. They might say it's archaic, right? But if someone uh, who is looking at pornography, they might say the same thing. How would you possibly live your life without masturbating to pornography? Well, I do live my life like that, and I'm actually really happy. And a lot of people view pornography like that. They see it as sexual junk food that's kind of ruining their sexual template, their sexual relationships, and quit it. And in the beginning, they might think, gosh, this is really hard. How could you do this? But eventually, they come to appreciate living a life where they don't spend hours on end every day looking at looking at pornography well well, you do have a chapter in your book that talks about the link between pornography and child pornography do do you think there is a kind of a a sort of uh yeah uh, a a slippery slope of some kind Uh, well i do think that i mean do we really think that there's someone out there perhaps say 25 years old right they've never seen pornography and one day they wake up up and they think to themselves, you know what I'd like to look at today, you know, insert weird fetish here. I don't think that's how it happens. I think what happens is people begin to watch pornography and then this old stuff doesn't do it for them anymore. What they have to do is view increasing shocking pornography because, of course, shock and anxiety actually boost dopamine, it boosts sexual uh, arousal, and they end up looking at things that perhaps a year ago may have made them frightened or nauseous, but today it's the only thing that can get them off. So I do think that very often that it's a slippery slope, as you say. Let, let me, um, do you want to respond to that, Charlotte? There's, there's, there's many, many, many a people in this world, and, and, and it's like reading the star sign that I'm a Virgo, and if I read it this week, it may be attentive to my needs, but then the next week it may not. I think that there's many different people with different perceptions of the way that they see things. And as long as we're providing informative uh, information for them to be able to make their mind up, then, you know, we, c- we can't speak for everybody, but we can just support people as they go. Charlotte seems very open to the evidence, which I want to commend her for, right? She's saying, okay, well, maybe we should look at these studies. People have a right to education. I think that's fantastic. So can I just ask a question to Charlotte? Charlotte, if, if, if what I am saying is true, if studies are showing that pornography can lead to addiction, uh, sexual dysfunction, if it can lead to a breakdown in relationships, would you be open to going where the, where the science points and saying, okay, you know, pornography can be detrimental and, and we should warn people about that or, or not? I think I. Do you know what the thing is? Is it unfortunately I can't equip myself with that, with that, with answering that particular question because I'm not educated enough in the studies that goes against what you say. And I know that there are. And if Jerry Barnett, for example, from Sex and Censorship was here, and maybe Adam could tell you differently, there are actually probably just as many studies that go against the studies that you've had. So the only thing I can do is look at it, look at it as a human element, a humanistic approach to it, that providing that we are open to the yes and to the no, then it's our choice to make that decision about the factor that happens in our lives. And that's the only way I can go. Let me bring in Adam. Adam, are you aware of any studies that um, yeah. go against what uh, Matt's talking about? Well, here? I think oh, there's probably a number. I'm not sure whether it was a Kinsey report, but I think there was a study which actually said, uh, you know, to contrast what Matt was saying, that actually masturbation does actually prepare you for sex, and your penis wouldn't actually be right for sex if you didn't masturbate. So, uh, as Charlotte rightfully says, there are studies out there that which will support that. But can I just say this: that what Matt's saying is a bit of, a, in a way, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because he's saying that pornography is wrong as a premise premise this in itself will promote guilt to anyone who studies or sees pornography so it's a little bit of a, a sort of um, self-fulfilling prophecy but the other thing here is yeah matt mentions being married yes and i'm sure a union of two people is very beautiful but relationships and marriage of that kind aren't for everyone and um, charlotte will will agree with me here that many people that use sex workers and probably pornography are in fact disabled people who no, who have no other avenue uh, for their desires i mean are we saying that we should fill them with this guilt trip that they shouldn't look at porn anymore and i I will agree with matt you know if it stays at that level of just looking at you know purely isolationist purely isolationist looking at nothing else then it maybe could be dangerous but there are many other things that are also isolationist isolation in itself is is not a nice thing no man is an island but i do feel matt that you're you're moralizing on other people's behalf really without their consent because for every negative out there you probably will find the positive um 
Um, and as I say, there is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in there as well. Um, let, let me toss it back to Matt then. Matt, I mean, a couple of things there. Firstly, um, I think Adam references there may be some studies which show that you know, masturbation and so on, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and that, and also, yeah, he raises this issue of what are those who don't have recourse to um, a marriage like you have? Um, this might be their only way of expressing their, their, their sexuality. Right. Thanks. Well, well, first of all, and I grant, right, this isn't an actual debate. So I'm certainly not expecting Charlotte uh, or Adam to come prepared to this sort of conversation with studies in hand. Okay. So I'm not expecting that. But I do want to say that I actually have looked at the research. I've just written a whole book about it. I have a whole chapter on masturbation, which actually argues against those who say that it's you know, healthy actually shows that it can correlate with things like anxiety and and these sorts of things. So it's not enough just to throw out something that you've heard. You actually have to show the the data behind it or else, you know, maybe it's just something that we've heard, but it isn't actually true after all. Um, Now, the idea that if people porn's their only outlet. Again, we're treating sex like it's a like it's a need and 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 certainly sexual desire is important and it's strong, but th- it's not like our only options are I have to repress 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 or engage in internet pornography. All right? To me that's like saying our only options are we have to be gluttons, you know, or we have to be anorexic. It's like, no, maybe there's a third option. Maybe we shouldn't so, be so binary about it. And I think there is a third option. I think it's what we would call sexual health. Regarding the self-fulfilling prophecy, Adam seems to be saying, Matt, you're coming at this from a moral perspective. Um, and, and maybe that somehow you know, shapes the way you look at this thing. Well, maybe it does, right? I mean, that might be somewhat of an ad hominem attack, though, to say, because you're a Christian, you have this particular view about pornography, therefore your argument is invalid. But you'll notice that I've actually referenced 33 neurological studies. I've referenced a Cambridge study that came out in 2014. Another study, uh, 2015, peer-reviewed research study, analyzed 22 different studies from seven different countries and showed that there is little doubt that on average those who consume porn uh, are more likely to hold uh, attitudes of sexual aggression and so forth. So again, fine, right? Like maybe I'm just obsessed about sex. Maybe I'm repressed. Maybe I'm moralistic. I don't think that for a second. But even if I was, that's not an argument against the sorts of studies that we're seeing coming out of academia. We're going to go to a quick break, folks, and then we'll be just back for five or ten minutes to uh, to conclude today's show. Uh, we'll hear again from uh, Charlotte. Uh, that's um, uh, one of our contributors, Charlotte Rose, a sexual freedom campaigner. Adam Scarborough is with me in studio from the Campaign Against Censorship. And Matt Fred's on the line, uh, author of a new book, The Porn Myth. We're discussing, is porn harmful to society? Again, today's show, obviously dealing with subjects of a sexual nature, may not be appropriate for children. Please do bear that in mind in terms of who is listening nearby to today's broadcast uh, you can find today's show of course if you want to listen later at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable come again in just a moment's time uh, we'll be continuing to discuss this important matter charlotte before you have to leave us do you want to sort of respond to anything that matt had to say in that last part of the show yeah i just want to add to, to matt's, matt's statement that you know um he spoke about is the two options well there is actually a third option and that should be education and i think that education is the key to all of this at the end of the day but i just wanted to uh within that time i've just managed to go onto my phone because i'm on the phone at the moment doing the interview with you guys but i thought i'd have a quick look on there whilst i have it um i'm just one of the things that i wanted to bring up was about cancer with wine and um just a quick this is what i googled on the first page of google that the um science blog dot cancer research uk dot dot org in the 29th of july 2005 2015 that uh, red wine um, can can actually uh, reduce the risk of cancer, whereas the Independent on the 8th of February 2016-17 said that wine can increase uh, cancerous cells within the body. So uh, all, I've, all I've got to do is state that, you know, despite whether we find lots of information to say one thing, that we need to be able to look at things in a biased way to say that there's always an equal and end opposite of everything that we say. So I appreciate Matt's hard work and efforts to go for the book, and I would love to read the book and find out the information that Matt had got. But there are just as many studies out there, whether it be UK-based or USA-based, 
stating the exact opposite. So providing you have given people, the readers, an option to be able to choose for themselves rather than being dictated to the views that you've found, then I'll be more than happy to read it. I, I mean, just, just I'd be interested in what Matt has to say about your analogy with um, wine and cancer and so on. But um, you, you say education is the key, Charlotte. I mean, are you willing... It do is you, the key, That's- yeah. And do you think young people should be educated about the issues Matt's presenting about these, these may cause you problems? Yes, if you, if you totally. Get addicted they to should be presented both sides. This is the whole point about education. It's about learning the both sides to give people an opportunity to have a choice. I never said right at the beginning that, that Matt was not correct, but I never said he was correct either. People need to have the opportunity to be educated in both sides of the story to be able to make the decision for their own mind. That's what, that's what the whole point of life is, right? It's to choose. And, and to have that choice in their life is, is, is what, we're, what we're, yeah. we're allowed at the end of the day. So providing that information is there, then yes. But I don't feel as though it's good to be dictated to that this is the only way it should be. Because it's not about what we all believe. It's about people's choices in life. Thank you very much for being on the line today, Charlotte. Really interesting You're to welcome. have to have you on. Thank um, you for letting me crush you all. Well, I appreciate you. Very kind of you to come on, even though your, your throat was not in great condition today. And I hope it hasn't worsened it too much being on the programme. But uh, in any case, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure there's a link to where you, people can find out more about you uh, from today's programme as well. Thanks for being with us today, Charlotte. Um, we'll come back to you in a moment, Adam. Um, Matt, just before um, we come back to Adam as well... Uh, Charlotte's effectively saying, you know, well, science is constantly showing us different things. You know, one minute studies show wine's good for you. The next minute it shows it's not good for you. And it's more more than likely the same for pornography as well. Did you want to respond to that? Yeah. I mean, I appreciate everything Charlotte said. And and it was great having her on the show. Great listening to her opinion. And I'm really happy to hear that she's open to where the evidence is pointing. Certainly scientific investigation by its nature being inductive is always open to change. That said, if the preponderance of evidence is all on one side of an issue, then I think that we should follow the science where it leads, all right? So there are no direct causal studies that would show, uh, you know, causation between smoking nicotine and cancer or uh, nicotine and addiction, okay? All we have is uh, correlative studies, uh, but the preponderance of evidence is on the side of the fact that Porn, uh, sorry, cigarettes do lead to cancer and so forth, and so we should just ex- we should accept that. Likewise, I'm saying that the p- preponderance of evidence lies on the side of saying porn is addictive. It leads to things like sexual dysfunction, increased uh, increased uh, you know uh, desire to look at more uh, disturbing forms of pornography. That it leads to relationship breakdown and so forth. And you know, I've. I, she says, let's look at the education. Well, I've done it. That's that's the whole reason I wrote the book. And so I'm happy to hear, too, that she's open to to reading the book and perhaps, you know, educating herself. And I think when she does that, she'll realize, you know, there's actually a lot of studies right now, as I say, 33 neuroscience-based studies that show porn can be addictive, and there's none on the other side. Now, actually, people might point to a 2013 or 2015 study by Nicole Prouse, okay? That's the only study anybody cites if they want to say pornography doesn't lead to addiction, doesn't cause addiction. But the problem with her studies is that there's actually been now nine different peer-reviewed papers written by some of the world's top neuroscientists, all of which are showing that Nicole Prouse misinterpreted her data. And so even her papers show that pornography leads to desensitization, hypofrontality, and sensitization. So uh, I'm all for it. Let's educate people. <laughs> okay. Um, Adam, anything you want to say as we start to close out? Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's nothing to do with today's subject, but interesting what Charlotte was saying about wine there. Wine also acts as a vasodilator, doing over uh, decreasing people's cholesterol. Um, but on the subject, what Matt's saying, interesting what Matt was saying about the other side. I mean, it's quite obvious why the other side, as Matt says, um, there are and in studies, because it's a case of leave well alone. Most people who use pornography as a release, as a safety valve, don't have a problem with it. This is why 
there is nothing on the other side. And um, again, there are so many variables here in these studies. I mean, if we were to look at some of those studies in Matt's book, you know, would take into consideration their upbringings of these people, why they had this disposition. And again, there's nothing said. And I, what I've seen about Matt's book, I must read it in greater detail about what would have happened to these people had they not had access to porn as a result. And, you know, if you go back to 18th century, 19th century psychiatry, there was actually a diagnosis then called masturbation psychosis, where patients were told to wave their arms around in the air 20 times a day in order to stop masturbating. 90% of men have masturbated, the other 10% are liars. <laughs> okay. I mean, okay. I, guess, I guess the point is, Matt, you, you know, people i mean pornography is older as is as old as art you know you you can find it on the walls of you know roman villas and so on um it it's hardly a new thing and and the things that go with it are hardly new either so is that an argument to say you know you're, you're kind of fighting a losing battle here no i mean there's all sorts there's lots of practices or actions that might be immoral that go back you know w- well into the past that doesn't mean that they're good uh, and so i think that's also true of pornography so, uh, yeah, it's been lovely talking to Adam. I, I really want to encourage people to get the book. I, I want to let people know, too, that 100% of the royalties from this book go to help a group in San Diego that support sexually trafficked women. So I'm not making a cent from this book. And so I hope people will, uh, will pick it up and decide for themselves. Okay. And uh, I'm sure a copy could be sent to Charlotte as well, who's interested in reading it. I'd love to. Yeah, Yeah, I'd love to. Great, great stuff. Thank you very much for being on the program today, Matt, to talk about your book. Uh, Again, thepornmyth.com if you want to find out more. Um, uh, If people want to find out more about the campaign against censorship, I believe the website is dlas.org.uk. Yeah, that's basically, or if they just Google campaign against censorship, it uh, will come up. There's quite a lot of archived material in there, etc., which is interesting read. I do the occasional article myself, and it's been great speaking to Matt here today, and um, been very, very, very interesting. Okay, so uh, there you go. That was the debate. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, It was fun. It was fun to participate in. Um, Would you consider becoming a patron? We are currently investing a lot of money in the work that we're doing here, um, putting you know well over ten thousand dollars in equipment. We're spending, I think, more than that on the new studio we're currently developing, and we need your help. So if you want things <laughs> like we have all these different courses that we put on regularly, like Bible studies and a study on um, on the confessions, all of these are led by university sort of professors, and they're really well done. We also have signed copies of my book. Um, we have beer steins, things like that. So consider it at least, even if you could just give five bucks a month. It's really cool to have like an army of people giving a relatively small amount so this stuff can continue. Obviously, too, I want to be doing in-person interviews more, so flying people in uh, and things like that. So consider it patreon.com slash Uh It would really mean a lot. Thank you.